Support Wrestle Talk. CM Punk is your new AEW World Champion, MJF was buried in his match with Wardlow, and plenty of debuts in AEW too. Here's my review of AEW Double or Nothing in about 10 minutes. Subscribe and enable notifications to always on for daily wrestling news videos. So let's get this out the way to start with. AEW pay-per-views are too long. I don't care how great the wrestling is, over five hours of wrestling is too long. The buy-in was essentially just comedy. An appearance from the acclaimed and the ass boys, and the match of Hookhausen versus Tony Nese and Mark Sterling, which was about what you'd expect. A bit of fun, nothing too fancy, but a nice, light-hearted way to open the show, with Hook getting another victory, though allowing Danhausen to get the actual pin on Mark Sterling. I've said before that I don't really get Danhausen, which I know is illegal to say on the internet, but I do still stand by that, but everyone clearly really likes this act and it's super duper over wherever they go, so full steam ahead on Hookhausen. The main show kicked off with MJF vs Wardlow, and let me tell you, after all the speculation early in the day with MJF potentially no-showing the event, this was the perfect choice to open the show. MJF entered first, reenacting a plane in the ring before Wardlow was brought out with his entourage of security. The match itself, though, kind of left more questions than answers regarding MJF. Wardlow absolutely squashed him, hitting 10 power bombs after MJF tried and failed to use the diamond ring, which was played up for laughs. Wardlow could have won after five power bombs, but took his foot off the pin at two, and then just did five more. MJF was then stretched out afterwards, featuring this great image of an oxygen mask being put over MJF's eyes. There's a word to describe this that might be overused in the wrestling community, but this was a burial. The injury anger was clearly designed to write MJF off our screens, at least for a while, so is he done with AEW? Is this all part of a larger story with MJF's frustrations with AEW? Is all of this one elaborate work and this is all just playing into it? I have no idea, but the one thing I did take from this opener is that Wardlow is an absolute megastar and should absolutely be pushed into either TNT or world titled contention before long. Having Wardlow revisit his feud against CM Punk, a match that he could have won before were it not for MJF interference, would be very interesting now Punk has the title. I think Wardlow being put over in defeat against Punk there could do wonders for him. Up next was the Young Bucks versus the Hardys, which was the first proper technical match on this card after the buy-in comedy match and the opening match that was more of an angle than a match. This had the dream billing attached to it, but I thought this never really quite reached that level. The Bucks are known for their incredible speed and ingenuity in the ring, but because they were in the ring with the Hardys, who aren't quite as fast as they once were, the pace was brought right down, and maybe there was a lack of chemistry, or someone was having an off day or something, but something didn't quite click for me in this match. It was fine, a decent match, with a solid conclusion of the Hardys hitting their finishes for the win after the Bucks failed to put them away with the Hardys finishes, their cockiness getting the better of them. The TBS title was on the line next, in the match that had the least build heading into it. This match wasn't fantastic, and the pace wasn't great either. Again, I'm not sure whether it was miscommunications, or a lack of chemistry, or someone having an off day, but Jade Cargill and Anna Jay didn't quite gel. Mark Stunning was back with a crutch that he slid into the ring, but Jay was the one to use it on Cargill for a near fall. Cargill then powered out of a Queenslayer, and managed to hit Jaded for the win after a distraction from newly debuting Stokely Hathaway, the former Malcolm Bivens in WWE. I am all four Hathaway managing Jade Cargill, I think they are a perfect fit. But there was one more debut to come, as in a post-match beatdown, Chris Statlander came down to make the save, and had a stare down with Cargill and Red Velvet, and she was then joined by Athena, the former Ember Moon in WWE. She is a very welcome addition to the women's division, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing what she can do. It was a fairly slow start to Double or Nothing, but the pace ramped up pretty quickly with the debuts leading into the next match. This trios match was so much fun. House of Black are a perfect unit, and I love all of their individual dynamics in the group, and paired with another incredibly quick paced trio in Death Triangle, this was a recipe for success, and success it was. Non-stop action the whole way through, amazing spot after amazing spot. It looked like Pac was about to get the win with the Black Arrow, but Julia Hart finally appeared in the ring, spat black mist into Pac's eyes, and joined the House of Black. It was a long time coming for that storyline payoff, which was almost certainly delayed, much 
like this match due to Phoenix's injury, but I'm glad it's happened now. Samoa Joe took on Adam Cole in the first of the two Owen Hart finals in a fun match. It was nothing super spectacular, it was just two very good wrestlers having a very good wrestling match. Adam Cole won surprisingly clean, mostly, with only just a little bit of Bobby Fish interference thrown in. No Satnam Singh, Jay Lethal, or Sanjay Dutt to speak of, which is good. I think they would have detracted from the match. Cole hit the boom and pinned Joe straight up, becoming the first winner. I should have known he was going to win. He was wearing pink. Immediately after came the next final, Britt Baker versus Ruby Soho, with a video package playing of the fact that Soho's entire AEW career so far has been her getting close and never following through. So in this match, she came close and didn't follow through. Nice. This match was actually really good and very much picked up towards the end, with lots of counters to finishers and a sharpshooter? Are you sure? Hmm. Alright. But it wasn't enough for Soho, as Baker managed to counter a victory roll into her own pin for the win. Should have known she was gonna win. She was wearing pink. The title belts were presented to them by Martha Hart, which was really lovely, and the belts look fantastic. The power couple take the belts, and we'll have to see how that impacts their trajectories going forward in AEW, and whether those belts can be defended, or if they'll only be defendable next year or something. After this was the mixed trios match where everyone was a heel, except Kazarian. Sammy and Ty really leaned into the heel side of things in this match, with Kazarian even turning his back on them during the match as well. Paige Van Zandt had her in-ring debut here, and I don't think it's a hot take to say she is not TV ready. I think she has potential, but her timing and signaling of spots was just not there yet at all. Most of the wrestling was done by Paige and Sky though, so that's okay. The big spot of the match was Guevara super kicking Conti by accident, which led to some big distractions and Sky got the win on Kazarian. And now the feud is done, thank God. We need a hard reset for the TNT title, and it seems to be going that way as Dante Martin stepped up to challenge Sky later in the night. Up next was a match that probably didn't need to be on this card. God, it was so long. Darby versus Kyle O'Reilly. And this was a brilliant match because both of them are brilliant wrestlers. This was a hard hitting and very technical affair and featured such wonderful spots as Darby's suicide dive being counted into a front chancery. Kyle O'Reilly putting the chain around Darby's neck into his mouth and then lifting him up with it until it snapped. And O'Reilly hitting three PKs and a diving knee drop to get the victory, which to be honest, I did not see coming. I thought this would be a simple case of Darby getting the win to avenge Sting's injury, feel good moment, but Kyle won, which was great. I love Kyle. And then it was the women's world title match. This was a fantastic technical match, which even garnered a women's wrestling chant from the crowd. It's such a shame it came at this point in the show though, because the crowd were insanely tired and I don't blame them. There is zero downtime in these pay-per-views. It goes from match to match to match to match, and there are a lot of matches. But regardless though, both these women put on a showcase and were brilliant. So many counters, wrestling fundamentals, mat wrestling, chain wrestling, it had it all, and concluded with Rosa hitting the Fire Thunder Driver for the win to retain her belt. I would not be opposed to AEW running this back somewhere down the line because I want more of it. And then, everything went insane. As Justin Roberts announced before the match, hit the fan. Jericho Appreciation Society came out in their best Backstreet Boys cosplay, the faces came out through the crowd to Moxley's music, and the brawl began, and the music played, and the brawl continued, and the music played, and everyone paired off to do their own things and it was cutting back and forth and back and forth and there was blood and chairs and tables and ladders and forks and mustard in the backstage area and oh my god! This was absolute insanity. This was complete nonsense, in the best way, but somehow still managed to have an emotional end to it. In my new favorite visual in all of wrestling, Eddie Kingston came down to the ring with a can of gasoline and poured it all over Chris Jericho. In this economy, what a heel. The problem was, was that Danielson was seconds away from winning and had Jericho in the label lock as Kingston doused Jericho. Danielson didn't take kindly to that and the two began brawling, allowing Jericho and Hager to come back into it. Jericho locked in the walls of Jericho on Danielson while Hager choked him out with the ring rope and Danielson passed out for the Jericho Appreciation Society win. This was bananas and I kinda loved it. pace was maintained in the tag title triple threat, which was just a 
bunch of fun. A bunch of lads hitting a bunch of moves in a bunch of ways. The Hoss boys got to do their Hoss off with Keith Lee, Powerhouse Ops, and Luchasaurus getting time together. But once more, the champions hit Thoracic Express and retained their belt after some Christian interference saved them from being cheated out of the belts. This was great, but seriously, FTR needed a title shot before long. And finally, the main event. The crowd were completely split through this whole match. 50-50 between Punk and Hangman, at times booing or cheering one more than the other. This match started strong, ended strong, had a strong middle, and was bloody wonderful. It was physical, technical, and while botchy in places, they covered for the botches well into the flow of the match. Apart from CM Punk trying to hit the Buckshot Lariat twice, and failing twice. Maybe should have left it at the first time, Punk. But after a long odd while, and some fantastic action and near falls, like when Hangman hit the GTS on Punk, there was a ref bump, and Hangman looked over at the title in the corner of the ring. He could use it, and he went to, but he stopped himself, and he deliberated, and he deliberated, and he deliberated, and he decided not to, throwing the title away, going for one more buckshot, which got countered into a GTS. One, two, three. CM Punk is your new AEW World Champion. Punk crying in the ring after he won the title nearly got me. What a love story to professional wrestling. What a comeback after we never thought we'd see him back again. I love Hangman, but I am so happy Punk is champion for Punk more than anything. This was an amazing end to a a good pay-per-view. The MGF Wardlow match, or Angle, started off the show strong, and while there was the occasional very good to great match peppered in between, it didn't really pick up again until the final three matches. I'll say it again, these shows are too long, and having this much wrestling, while a lot of it was very good, drags a show down when it's not reaching the high highs of other matches on your show. Double or Nothing 2022 is a 4 out of 5 show, but will go down as a classic pay-per-view because of that ending main event and the MGF vs Wardlow opener for historical significance. Now check out some more videos such as Ollie's initial reactions to when Punk won the belt. The, the closing image of the show was of CM Punk holding the AEW World Championship aloft because he has beaten Hangman Page, that transitional champion, to become the AEW World Champion.